Hey everyone, Rich Gassaway here. Thank you for giving me the gift of your time to listen to this podcast. I really, really appreciate your support of my message. As you know, the podcast is completely free to download and listen to. Today you'll be listening to the 142nd consecutive weekly show. I've never missed a week since it started. Today's interview is an incredible near-miss survival story that you'll want to hear and share with others. I need your help. Really, I do. In helping me locate some departments or associations that would be interested in hosting a situational awareness program this year. The programs range in length from one hour for a conference keynote format to a half a day to a full day program. If you've hosted a program and it's been a few years, consider a refresher class. The program is constantly being updated with new material and your department likely has some new members and officers that need to learn about situational awareness. Consider reaching out to another department or agency to co-host a program. Many smaller departments partner up with their mutual aid departments and they jointly host a program. It can be a great way to build camaraderie while learning about a topic that can, quite literally, save your life. If you have any doubts, just listen to today's podcast interview. The guest attended a two-hour program that I did in North Carolina last year. His comments about how the program changed his entire way of thinking are priceless, and a powerful testimony to the value of training on this critically important topic. The new Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy launches this month. Now for the first time ever, you and others in your department can take your understanding of situational awareness and high-risk decision-making processes to a whole new level. Since flawed situational awareness is a leading contributing factor in near-miss and casualty reports, it's a really important topic that most first responders have received little to no training on, and that needs to change. If you want to check out the Academy, just go to samatters.com and click the green box on the right side of the homepage labeled Online Academy. Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada, keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities, is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. Hello, and welcome to Episode 142 of the Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-risk, high-consequence environments. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming and time to avoid bad outcomes. I'm coming to you today from my office in Minnesota. I've taken a few weeks off the road to work on the SA Matters Online Academy, which launches this month, January 2017. I'm super excited because the Academy is a convenient and affordable way for all first responders to get trained on how to develop and maintain situational awareness while working in high-risk, high-consequence, decision-making environments. One of the questions I get asked a lot by readers is, when are you coming to my area? I want to attend a program. Or where will you be next? It's really easy for you to find this out. There's a link to the schedule of the upcoming events right on the SA Matters homepage. Just click on the blue box on the right side labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. If you're interested in hosting a program, here's a way you can do it at a reduced cost. I schedule many what I call companion programs. These are programs on adjoining days to other programs. So if you see I'm delivering a program within a couple hours of your department and you think you might want to tag along as a companion, contact me. You can save as much as 20% off the program cost by being a companion to an existing program. Last month, five departments, companion together, and I presented five consecutive programs on five consecutive days, all on different topics and all at different locations. But all five departments got a deal on their program cost. And you know what? None of them complained about the money that they saved. That's what I call a win-win. 
My second passion after situational awareness is developing the leadership skills of company officers, something I did a terrible job of when I served as a fire chief. I was guilty of promoting officers before they were prepared. <clears throat> that was my fault. And then I got angry at them when they didn't know how to provide good leadership to their crews or to their station, which was also my fault. So I partnered with Captain Patrick Harper from the Indianapolis Fire Department, and we created a company officer development institute. The institute ranges from two days to five days. And here's the cool thing. No PowerPoint. That's right, no PowerPoint. No book either. The program was developed from scratch to help company officers with the skills they need to be successful at leading at the company level. We share practical actionable best practices for leadership, problem solving, conflict resolution, teamwork, motivation, generational leadership, discipline, coaching for performance improvement, and more. The program is truly customized to the issues being faced by the people that are in the room. And why no PowerPoint? Well, we, what we believe is when adults are engaged in the process of learning and not just being lectured to, Learning can be fun. And the important part is, the lessons stick. Given the number of emails and private messages that I received recently from company officers about what I've been saying about this course has struck a nerve. There's obviously a lot of frustrated company officers out there. But the decision to host the program is made from the top of the organization. So if you're a company officer or a firefighter and you're frustrated and you're being challenged, Ask your chief or training officer to visit the SA Matters website and click on the Contact Us link, and we'll get the details worked out for a program. When your organization gets sick and tired of being sick and tired of undesirable, uncommitted, unprofessional, undedicated members destroying morale and sucking the life out of your organization, then you'll know the time is right. Okay, in today's feature segment, I interview Waynesville Fire Captain Ricky Mahaffey about a near-miss event where three firefighters almost died at a routine chimney fire. Ricky attended one of my situation awareness programs in North Carolina last year, and he had his quote-unquote aha moment as he learned about how to develop and maintain situation awareness while operating in high-risk environments. His story is both eye-opening and bone chilling. I'm going to jump right into the feature segment now, but when I'm done, stick around because I'm going to announce where the upcoming Situational Awareness Matters Tour Stop events are going to be. Okay, onward to the feature segment and my interview with then engineer, now captain, Ricky Mahaffey of the Waynesville, North Carolina Fire Department. It was early morning. We come on at 7, and um, it was a little after 8. Um, and I was actually talking with my assistant chief and he had just left and the tones dropped for a residential structure fire. Um, in Waynesville, we, uh, we are a combination department at the time we had two paid staff on duty and then we depend on about 30 volunteers. But as everyone knows that volunteers as great as they are, and we have some of the best that during the day, most of them are at work. So right out the door, you know, my mind starts thinking of, of staffing issues and not having enough people on scene. Mm -hmm. So I get in my engine. I'm the engineer, only guy on the truck, and I'm responding. What What um, did dispatch tell you you were going to? The, at the time of dispatch, that's all they said was a residential structure fire. They were waiting for further information. Okay. Um, said they that the, they had one caller, and it was light smoke showing. Um. It, while I was in route, they updated they updated me with more information. They had got a call from the homeowner who stated that th there was a fire. It looked like it was in the attic area and that he was seeing flames from the inside of the house. Okay. So um, the call was roughly about a mile and a half from uh, my station, so I got on scene pre relatively quickly. Uh, my second engine, however, was about five miles away, so it took him a little bit longer to get there. Um, is that, is that two more people? No, just one more. One more. Okay. Yeah, we um, we have one on. At the time, we had one on each truck. Okay. So were you so, alone on? Were you alone on the truck you were on? Yes, sir. 
Oh, okay. You yeah. said two paid yeah. staff. I was thinking they were both on the on the same truck. It's one on each oh, yeah. apparatus. Yeah, one at each station. Okay. Um, so we, as I turned up the 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 road, it was on was more like a small driveway, and then it, as as you went up the road, it um, split, and there was a trailer to the right, and then the, the house that the actual car was at is to the left. And this was as I pulled in, I you know I seen the house as a two story wood frame structure, um, had a big wraparound porch in the front with a big um, carport type open garage in the back. And on my side, which would have been the A side of the structure, that's when I seen the, uh, this massive chimney. I mean, it was when I say massive, it was a huge chimney, um, probably four foot in width, and it six to eight feet that it stood over the eave of the house. You know, so a two-story house, and then you got, you add that much more of a chimney over the the gutter line, mm-hmm. and it was a it was a rock rock faced chimney was all I could tell from the outside. And as I pulled up, I seen there was smoke coming from the eaves um, on the on the a side of the structure where the chimney's at, and I seen some smoke coming from the uh, chimney itself, but I, there was no visible flames at that time. And I made note of the chimney, the size of the chimney, and made sure to park my apparatus outside of that um, clap zone. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I seen that and, you know, being an engineer, that's, uh, I made note of that and made sure that I put my truck where it would not be in any danger of that chimney if it failed. Mm-hmm. And so I got out, I done my 360, made my scene size up, advised everybody what we had. And, uh, at this time, by this time, my second truck was getting on scene. My assistant chief had arrived on scene, and um, he was taking over the the command function as far as the radio and stuff. And I was more in an operations mode at this time. Now, ho- hold and, on um, a sec. Hold on a second. Do you have okay. any other help coming? Um, I had um, one mutual aid department coming. Is that automatic aid, or did you? It's call automatic them? aid. No, that's automatic aid, and um, they um, they are. Uh, a volunteer department okay to the um west of us okay because and you guys are in a tight spot right now working fire with three people yeah three people um i did we did um i did get two volunteers that showed up relatively quickly do they go I right got, to the scene yeah they, they come right to the scene okay um and so that was that was help and then i've got like i said i had my um my other truck coming, which he just parked. He parked behind me, and in, in, in the event that w- that I needed anything from his truck, water, whatever, then I would take care of that as the engineer of my truck. I would take care of that, and he goes right to fighting fire. Okay. So, and that's what he did. That's what he did. He he um, geared up and uh, got one of the uh, volunteers that had showed up, and they they made their way in the house. And um, as the uh, Mutual aid company was pulling in, and um, how many were on the, how many were on that truck? There was three on that truck, if I if I remember correctly. Okay, they um they're 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 good help when they when they get there. They usually have a truck full. Okay, and um, you can pretty much guarantee that. Mm-hmm. So, they went to work. You know, he went inside, advised what we had. Um, they. When you went in the house, it was a two-story house, but as you walked in and into the house, the um, living room area and kitchen area was a vaulted ceiling. And then on the let's see, the B side of the structure, that was actually a two-story house. That's where they had bedrooms upstairs. But on the D side of the house, that was vaulted ceiling. It was all open. That's where the big fireplace was on the inside. And once they got inside, they advised that they... They had no visible flames inside, but they did have smoke. And um, by this time, there was some flames starting to show around the chimney, around the eave of the and of the house, and around the chimney on the outside. So they, of course, they you know they went investigating more. They went upstairs and they found the attic access. And once they got in the attic, on the two story side of the house, they could see towards the vaulted ceiling side and they could tell that the fire was was running up inside that vaulted ceiling and it looked like it had originated or somewhere near the chimney that's what that's what it looked like to them so they you know they commenced to tearing out and trying to 
attack the fire and um, advising us what they had and what they were doing. And, and, of course, we were on the outside looking. You know, not really, there wasn't really much we could do with them being in there and just kind of keeping them aware of what was going on while they dug deeper and deeper trying to figure out how to attack this fire. And they had requested, um, I, I can't remember what it was. It was probably a, a New York hook or a pike pole. Mm-hmm. Um, or another one, because I knew they took they took one in with them when they went in. So that's what I did. I I got the pike pole off the truck, and let me say this: where this chimney was, this is another um, epic fail on my part. Where this chimney was, the majority of the people that had showed up to help, you know, the the mutual aid companies and the volunteers, they were pretty much gathering within a fifteen or twenty foot radius of this chimney. Um, the uh, the collapse zone that I noticed when I pulled up, as soon as my feet hit the ground, that left me. You know, I was worried about this thing falling on my truck. But once I got into operations mode and fire ground mode, that chimney totally left my mind. Even though I was looking at it, watching the smoke and the fire, you know, along with my assistant chief, the, the fact that the, I thought that chimney might fall when I first put pulled up, that thought had totally left me. Why do you think that um, is? Um, I'm I'm going to say tunnel vision, mm-hmm. um, or you know, just worried more about getting the fire put out and saving these people's house um, than, than I guess uh, my safety or my crew safety. Um, so you just, you have all these people gathered around that chimney, the same chimney you had staged your apparatus to stay out of the collapse zone. And as they're all standing around near the chimney, you're not even thinking about that at that time? No, it, no sir. Never never crossed my mind. Hmm. Um, it never crossed my mind to the point where we actually, either on the front side of the house, so there's a wraparound porch. And the steps to go up onto this porch came down to the bottom of where this chimney was. And we actually had put a ladder up to be able to ladder that porch in case we needed to get on the roof. So there was actually a ladder at the base of this chimney going up on that port, that wraparound front porch. Hmm. So, um, with that being said, though, they asked for a tool. I believe, like I said, I believe it was a New York hook. Um, so I took it around to the back door, um, dropped it off to them, was walking back. And as I was walking back, I was walking right in the line of where this chimney would fall. And there was, um, it was either two or three, I can't remember, um, guys from our mutual aid department that had stopped me. They had asked me a question. I don't recall what that question was, um, but they were, we were talking, I'm sure it was something about the operations and what was going on. And uh, while we were talking, somebody, I heard somebody holler and they screamed that the chimney was falling. And I, I heard it. Um, one of the guys that I was talking with heard it because he took off immediately and took off running. Um, the other gentleman that I was there with, he did not hear it. And as I heard it, I kind of pushed him and and we took off, you know, took off running, told him we need to run. And as I look back, you could see the chimney falling. Um, of course, when the I don't even remember who it was that the seen the chimney falling first and hollered. But um, when he did that, of course, people just started scrambling, you know. Because there was quite a few people that was close to the chimney. Um, myself and the two from the mutual aid department, we were the closest. And um, so we took off, and I pushed the guy. And of course, he didn't he didn't buck me. He, he you know he he seen everybody else moving, and I guess he he realized we needed to run. And and we took off, and I was running in the direction of my engine, and um, and was running out of room. And and when the the chimney fell. It was it was it was a thunder. I mean, it was such a, a a large chimney. When it failed, my interior guys actually came out of the house because they felt it inside and didn't know what happened. Hmm. They thought something had happened on the outside, and they were coming out to see what that was before they continued their operations. So, as this chimney fell, we're running away, and I felt it hit the ground. You know, I felt the I don't know the the thump. Yeah, and um, 
as I look back, there was two or three large rocks that was actually chasing us. That's, you know, and I mean, they were right there behind us. And as I turned back to continue watching where I was running, I was actually expecting, I was waiting to feel them take out my legs. Now, when you they say large that, rocks, are you talking like bowling ball size? Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this large, almost like creek rock. Mm-hmm. And, um, of course, you know, as I got to my engine, I, you know, I was, I was running out of room to run, you know, and I looked back and they, it, they had stopped. The rocks had stopped, you know, the chimney was down. The, um, they were roughly the, the two or three that were, I'll, I'll say were chasing me were roughly three to five feet behind me. That's where they had stopped. Mm-hmm. So they were that close. Um, the ladder that was um, over on the porch, it was destroyed. And of course, we were all just just uh, amazed. And and initially, we all ran over to the chimney because we we weren't sure that everybody had ran away. Hmm. You know, so we you know we just kind of uh, myself and my assistant chief, we went over there just to kind of double check and look around just to be sure that you know because we all went into that. Um, self-survival mode, so to speak, mm-hmm. and just kind of scattered. And so we weren't 100% sure when it failed that there wasn't somebody under it. Now, in the path where it landed, is that right where you guys were standing? If you Had you not moved, would it have hit you? Yes, sir. If we had not moved, there, there would have been um, three line of duty deaths that day. There's not a doubt in my mind. Um, because we were... We were right in the path of it, and we were within 15 feet of the house, and maybe even a little closer. But So we were within 15 feet of the house, and we're talking about a chimney that was 16, over 20 feet tall. Hmm. Now, the ladder that you said was destroyed, at any time during this incident, had anybody been up or down that ladder? No. No, I no, we were. It was put up, but it was only put up for the if we needed to to access the roof. Mm-hmm. And I think once we realized that it was a vaulted ceiling, uh, and it was on that side, then the ladder position it was really it was in a bad place anyway. Mm-hmm. So it just it was never used, but it was you know it was never removed either. So describe for me, kind of what the scene was like. And the discussions were like, as you walked over to see, is there anybody in this rubble? There, <laughs> there wasn't. It was, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion. You know, it was. You know, my. I remember my assistant chief looking at me, and you know, he just had that look on his face, and I'm sure I did as well. You know, what just happened? Because you know, again, I go back to when I pulled up to when I got out of the truck. You know, my mind totally left that chimney, and and it's my mind totally left that call after it happened. Really, until I came to um, Durham and listened to you, hmm. and and you know, and when you ask and you you know when you ask if anybody had a close call they want to talk about, that's the first thing that went through my mind, and hmm. and and I wasn't quite ready to talk about it then. Yeah, um, but. So I think that was I think that was the one that got me that got me the most that day and uh, you know I'm sure my assistant chief too he never said it but you know how did we miss that <clears throat> you know he's got he's got almost 30 years of experience now fixing to retire you know I've got 15 and there was plenty of other guys on that scene and how did we all miss it yeah yeah you know, and and what would the what would the rest of that day and many days after that been like if if we had got killed that day? You know, if all because all because and it's tunnel vision. It's it's worrying about you know worrying about something else when there's a immediate danger right in front of you. Mm-hmm. And you had already given thought to the idea that that chimney might fall when you were staging your apparatus. Yes, I, I, you know that's, and I think that's where I think that's where our, some of our issues are is, you know, with engineers and and those programs we beat, we beat it and we beat it and we beat it like a dead horse that we have to, 
you know, we have to be careful where we're parking our apparatus. You know, we have to make sure our apparatus are parked at the right angles. We, you know, apparatus positioning is a big subject. Mm-hmm. Situational awareness is not. <laughs> if you if you take that same scenario and you put it in a fire academy for a rookie fireman, there's there's no hardly any mention of it. Right. Right. So that had that had been beat into my head as an engineer. But once I come out of that truck and was on the ground and was, you know, kind of in the operations mode, situational awareness had not been beat into my head. So that that hazard that was a hazard for my engine left my mind because it wasn't a hazard in my mind for me as a fireman or the other people on the on the fire ground. That's a really interesting observation is that you would consider that chimney a hazard for the engine <clears throat> and the well-being of the engine, but you would not think of it as a hazard for your own well-being. And that really makes the situational awareness tie-in lesson from from the class that you attended, right? Yes, that's that's where I, I said that. I probably haven't given three thoughts to that call since since then until I came to Durham and listened hmm. to you. Hmm. And and from the time I left there, it was on my mind. We um, The... Four, the other three captains that came with me down there, um, we talked about it on the way home, and then that's what when I got home, I decided I was going to email you, mm-hmm. you know, and just tell you what I opened experience it was because it was, and it has changed, it has changed my whole outlook on the way that I, I run calls, the way that I, you know, I look at situations, and not just not just fire situations, wreck situations, you know, it is. It's opened my eyes to a different way of of seeing things. Perfect. <laughs> that that's the perfect testimonial as to what I'm trying to accomplish in that class is give people a different way of looking at things. <laughs> uh, what'd you guys learn from this? Did you, you know, if you were to give some advice to people, what would your advice sound like? Well, my first piece of advice would be to attend one of your seminars um <laughs> well thank you <laughs> yeah i mean um i mean i'm so passionate about it now that my my shift which there's only three of us i'm fixing to be four but um i signed my whole shift up for your academy oh nice thank you um because you know it ain't just me you know especially you know with us there's only three of us so there's a good possibility that that i won't be there you know if we have multiple calls and i want all my guys to to change their way of thinking. Right. Well, arguably you could say everybody on the scene of that call had the same kind of block in their thinking that day. Right. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, I don't think any of them had the, I don't, I don't know if any of them seen it like I did when I pulled up, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, but the, yeah, it was right there in front of us the whole time. You know, it wasn't like it was hit off on the, uh, see side of the structure where we couldn't see it i mean it was it was right in front of my engine where we were running running the call mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now <clears throat> when when you all got back from that call did you guys do any kind of a discussion or a debrief or a wow that was close you know what did we learn yeah, from this it was, yeah it was one of those it was a you know it was a wow you know we, we could have got killed today Mm-hmm. And then it was, uh, thank goodness we didn't, and we move on. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's you know, it's what we do as as firemen, and it's a it's a good trait some days, and it's a bad another um, other situations like this one. You know, we we get the bad calls, we see the bad stuff, and we're able to put it put it out of sight, out of mind, and move on. And mm-hmm. you know, but then there's situations like this where we don't mm-hmm. need to put it out of sight, out of mind. We need to bring it up to the front. We need to talk about it. And we need to figure out what we got to do to keep it from happening again. Now, there's one question <clears throat> that I often ask of people who've had these near miss events. At the end of your shift, you went home, and we didn't t- talk about you know family that you have or anything. But apparently, I would guess that somewhere there, there's people somewhere in that area who care about you. Oh yes. Um, I got four. I got four kids. Okay. <laughs> Did you tell them? Um, 
I don't think I did. I, I, I don't, I don't believe I did because um, whenever I was talking to my wife about doing this podcast, um, she, she didn't remember me telling her about the call. She, she didn't recollect me coming home and saying, "Hey, I about died yesterday." Um, well, so I don't, I don't. Well, hold on a I second. Did. She didn't recollect you telling her because you didn't tell her. Exactly. <laughs> because if you'd have told her, she would have remembered that conversation, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. There's not much she forgets. Well, especially one with that potential <laughs> consequence. So then you told her you're going to do this podcast, and she's like, podcast? What's that all about? What are you going to talk about on a podcast? Then you had to tell her? Yes, that's that's pretty much. Well, I think what I said was that I was going to do the podcast about a, a near miss, and she said, "Well, when did you have near miss?" So, and the conversation went from there. Mm-hmm. And and how that how that how that settled for her? Oh, not too good. She wasn't too happy about it. Mm-hmm. Now, partially, probably wasn't happy that it happened. But then probably wasn't happy that you never mentioned it, right? Exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah, because any time um, – now, my wife, is a, she is a volunteer at mm-hmm. my paid department. Mm-hmm. So, so any time that I do anything that she deems unsafe, I can assure you I hear about it. Um, so, so, yeah, she was not too happy to hear about this. So you had to have that kind of tough conversation – a couple of years afterwards. Yes. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't say a tough conversation. My, um, my wife, she works, um, full time on for the, uh, ambulance service mm-hmm. in the County. So she, you know, she understands what, what I do and I understand what she does, which makes our relationship a whole lot easier. Yeah. You know, for situations like this. So it, it's, it's <clears> a good discussion, but again, she wasn't happy about the fact that it happened and she wasn't happy about the fact that I never told her. Yeah. Well, I think what makes the conversation tough <clears throat> is that you're having a conversation with someone who's, you know, your life mate, and you're talking essentially about your mortality and how close you came to leaving her a widow and leaving your kids orphans. That's a tough conversation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, it is. Hmm. It sure is. And... And for me, the, the you know the tough part for me that day was, is there was people those <clears throat> people there were they they depended on me to you know yes my assistant chief was there but it's my responsibility to keep them safe and and there would have been a, there would have been three of us it wouldn't have just been myself hmm. there would have been three of us that day that wouldn't have went home at least three maybe more but at least three um, that. That would have went, you know, that that wouldn't have went home that day. You know, their their kids wouldn't have had a dad, their wives wouldn't have had a husband, their moms and dads wouldn't have had a son, and and that's what that's one thing that really, um, after after listening to you and Dermot, really set in on me. You know, the you know these these guys, even my mutual aid departments, you know, they they depend on me to to be able to see stuff like that. Because mm-hmm. that's the position I'm in, and it's my responsibility to do that, and and it's my responsibility to educate myself to become more aware of the situation. Hmm. How old are your How old were your kids at that time? Let's see. My son was was roughly two years ago, so he was um, 14. Um, I had a nine year old daughter at the time. A seven-year-old daughter and a five-year-old daughter. Wow! Oh. Wow! That kind of chokes me up. And you know, so hmm. wow. <clears throat> so I assume you look at things differently now. Oh yes, yes. Uh, that a hundred percent turnaround. I, I, you know, the three hundred and sixty. I've done, and the way that I look, you know, at at every situation, we've um, not because of this situation, or even because of this podcast. But one of my one of our volunteer lieutenants, he he has started. You know, we've had a couple um, 
well, how to do the death in Waynesville. And um, in the past, one was um, a heart attack, and then another one was a gas tanker explosion years mm-hmm. ago. And mm-hmm. so we've started looking into some of those because, you know, we it's our job to learn so that, that things like this don't repeat themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's that's why I'm doing this podcast. That's why I listen to your to your podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why I'm doing the Situational Awareness Academy, because mm-hmm. um, it's our job to learn. You know, if 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 we don't learn from what's happened to others, then then they have truly died in vain. No kidding. No kidding. So <clears throat> yeah, and that's one of the things I. Be, that's one of the things I say in the class is that we owe it to the fallen to learn from how it happened. They died so we could learn something. Yes, we have to be students of, I don't want to say their mistakes, but but of their situations. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's not a matter of pointing blame. It's just a matter of saying what happened and what can we learn from it so we don't fall in the same hole to the same outcome. That's exactly right. Well, Ricky, thank you so much for coming on and giving the listeners the gift of your time, the gift of your experience. It can be hard to come on and say, uh, I could have done better. I owed it to those firefighters to be uh, more aware of the things that were happening and that I learned something from this. But the important thing is, one, you learned, and now you're sharing it. Now Now you're giving a gift to the firefighting community to say, learn from this. I almost fell in the hole, but I didn't. And now I have a story that I want you to know about. That's that's so powerful. Thank you. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity and the platform that you're putting out there for people like myself to be able to share these stories so that, you know, so that hopefully it'll save somebody's life. And and some of the stories that I've listened to from you, hopefully that helped save my life and some of my guys' life. Yeah. So I pre- I appreciate what you're doing and your calls because it is it is a very very good call because like I said, situational awareness is not at the forefront of firefighting training. Yeah, for and sure. It, and it needs and it needs to be. And I think it's going to. I think it'll get there. And 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 that's a, and a big part to you. And uh, and for that, I I thank you. No, thank you. Thank you again to Captain Ricky Mahaffey for sharing the details of your near-miss event. If you've experienced or witnessed a near-miss and would like to have a platform to share your lessons learned with others, contact me by visiting the SA Matters website and clicking on the Contact Us link on the top of the homepage. Think about it for a moment. The lessons learned from your near-miss event could save the life of another first responder. It's really simple to do. You just listen to the interview with Ricky, if you want to share your experience, then just contact me. Okay, as I always do, I want to take a moment to thank the departments and organizations that have hosted recent Situational Awareness Matters tour stop events. I do this to show my appreciation to those organizations who put forth the effort to organize, advertise, and fund great training experiences for their members and others in their region. Recent tour stops included the All Hazards Incident Management Team Conference in Oklahoma City, the Oakland District Fire Department in Weirton, West Virginia, the Jefferson County LEPC hosted by the Wintersville Fire Department in Ohio, the Swissvale Fire Department in Pennsylvania, the Minerva Fire Department in Ohio, and the Western Reserve Fire District in Ohio. Peters Township Fire Department in McMurray, Pennsylvania, who hosted the final Situation Awareness Program for 2016 on December 26th. If you'd like to attend an upcoming Situation Awareness Matters Program, on January 14th, I'll be at the Singerly Fire Department in Maryland, January 15th at the Red Hill Fire Company in Pennsylvania, January 17 and 18 at the St. Paul Fire Department in Minnesota, February 3 and 4 at the Racine County Fire Chiefs Association in Wisconsin. February 7th, the Texas Fire Educators Conference in Corpus Christi, Texas. February 13, the Morris Fire Department in Minnesota. February 23rd, the Clovis Fire Department in California. And on March 3rd, the Lynchburg Fire Department in Virginia. 
The last time I did programs in southwest Minnesota, I stopped by and visited the sponsor of this podcast show, Midwest Fire. Midwest Fire makes amazing, I mean truly amazing, all poly bodied fire apparatus. And it's changing the industry. You seriously need to check them out. Midwestfire.com. Anyhow, I got a chance to sit down and talk with a few of their employees about what separates Midwest Fire from their competitors. Let's listen into the conversation I had with engineer Tyler LeBrun about lean manufacturing and how this differentiates Midwest Fire from their competitors. Let's listen in. So Tyler, in a conversation that we had earlier, you mentioned the, the term lean process or lean manufacturing. And uh, and then when we were out on the shop floor, you were like snapping around these Japanese terms that, uh, you know, I guess in the lean manufacturing world mean something. What What is all this, you know, voodoo magic of, of lean manufacturing or lean process? What does it mean? And why would a customer even care that you run a, a lean facility? Well, one of the big things with lean is it's very focused on the customer. Um, basically, you look at it as what the customer is willing to pay for. There's waste in our process. There's waste in everybody's process that they have if they own any type of business. And what waste is defined as is anything the customer is not willing to pay for. Um, We had a good example down there of, you know, maybe you've been in some different shops and seen stuff just scattered around everywhere, like maybe a floor jack, like somebody used it and left it right there. Well, now the next time somebody wants to go find that floor jack, if they've got to walk around for five or ten minutes, that's a waste that the customer's not willing to pay for. They, they don't want our guys to be down here wandering around looking for parts. They want them to be putting things onto their truck, and that stuff is value-added. The walking around and stuff that you're not willing to pay for is non-value-added. And that's, that's really what drives down and you know brings us to be able to offer something better to the customer, that we are building a truck more efficiently, which obviously pays, passes savings on to them. Um, we talked about our inventory control system, Kanban, one of those fun Japanese these words um, that basically uh, allows allows for a system to be around our parts ordering that the operators control that that they go down and they reach a minimum point they pull a card they do that kind of stuff but the parts are always there for them not only are the parts always there but there's not an excess amount of those parts which costs us money to carry which we would then obviously no doubt have to pass on to the customer but by reducing all these costs getting rid of all the waste we're really able to better give the customer a more quality truck, you know, faster and, and possibly at, at, a, at less cost than a competitor. So everybody here, I assume, um, has to go through some training to learn how to be part of a lean process manufacturing? Yep. So there's there's a couple of different ways that we've done that. There's been some guys that have been able to go out and do actual hands-on training at, um, you know, some seminars or that kind of stuff. Um, we've also gone out and taken tours of some real-world Cal-ass facilities in the area that we've been lucky enough to have. We also do some mentorship. That's something that I've been able to take my experience and kind of help the guys look at all that kind of stuff. But it really boils down to, you know, having – Having, having a team that's willing to work together and continuously improve. And that continuous improvement is the big thing, is that we don't have a set goal in mind that we are going to be at X in 2016 and then we're never going to do anything again. Lean is really about continuous improvement. And being just realizing that, that you're constantly in the pursuit of perfection. If you're not improving, you're on the decline. So that's, that's, that's really some of the... Some of the ideas behind that, with the continuous improvement, and obviously training the employees. Well, there you have it, folks. Continuous self improvement and lean manufacturing. It's what separates Midwest Fire from their competitors. Check them out at MidwestFire.com. Thank you, Midwest Fire President Sarah Atchison, and all your staff for your awesome commitment to improving first responder safety. I sincerely appreciate your support of my mission. If you're not a member yet of the SA Matters community, please consider subscribing by clicking on the red box on the right side of the homepage that says free membership. If you're already a subscriber, consider contacting someone you know who you think might benefit from getting the newsletter and ask them to subscribe. 
Membership is free, and when you sign up, I'll send you a special report that I've created just for the new members called 25 Best Practices for Improving First Responder Safety. When you join, you'll receive a newsletter each month that summarizes the blog articles and the podcasts for the previous month. The newsletter include clickable links to the blogs and the podcast as well. It's just a way for us to stay in touch with each other in case you don't visit the website every week to get the blogs and the podcasts. You can also get connected with me on social media by following at Rich Gasway on Twitter. The SA Matters Twitter community is approaching 18,000 followers of our mission on two Twitter accounts that we use. Thank you to the Twitter community for supporting my mission. On LinkedIn, you can find me by searching at Rich Gasway on LinkedIn. On Facebook, you can follow the SA Matters Facebook page. My personal page has reached its maximum limit, which is 5,000. So if you send me a personal Facebook request, I won't be able to accept it. I'm sorry about that. So you want to follow the SA Matters Facebook page. Remember to swing by and check out the new online academy. You can go to the SA Matters website, click the green button on the right side of the homepage. It says Online Academy. Well, that's it. Episode 142 is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Captain Ricky Mahaffey. Thank you to our podcast sponsor, Midwest Fire. Thank you to all of our live event hosts. Thank you to all of our online academy students. And thank you, our listeners, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.